Yeah, so to immanentize the eschaton implies that uh, there is nothing outside of time in eternity, not even God, because you're also immanentizing the Trinitarian processions in this historical process called the dialectic. Now, I'm I'm aware of the fact that we might be losing some of, some of our audience, and so let me just uh, pivot for a moment, because what Hegel did in the early part of the 19th century in some ways is of inestimable influence, even though there aren't that many Hegelians left today. But the reason why I suspect from your book is that this uh, dialectical idealism, which shows us that the absolute spirit, you know, is realizing itself in time through conflict. And, you know, it, it was a very idealistic sense, not in the versus pessimism, but the idea of absolute spirit. Well, Marx was a Hegelian. He hijacked the dialectic, but pivoted from idealism and absolute spirit to materialism, where the physical is the only thing that is real and that material progress is reducible to economic and political philosophy, as it were. And so, this really, what I, I believe you show convincingly, and others too, that uh, if Marx hadn't adopted the dialectic and weaponized this in terms of class struggle, class conflict, we're not really sure what would have happened to Hegel's idealism because not many people were into how absolute spirit actualizes itself through historical process. But suddenly it's taken up by Marx and Engels and others. What happens next? Yeah, no, that's a great way, great summation of it. And I think that he really brought it into something far more concrete. That it seems sort of uh, as too esoteric with Hegel, maybe. Right. So what happened next was he, Marx promised that the revolution was inevitable. Uh, and he, he interestingly identified two main obstacles to revolution, which was the faith and the family. I think in both cases, you have a context for your suffering. You know, the faith teaches you that if your circumstances are, are if you're suffering, to suffer, suffer well your circumstances. And that is a real obstacle to revolution, which wants people to not suffer well, but to suffer poorly and suffer loudly and to be enraged by your circumstances until you reach a, a, a point where you're willing to be revolu a revolutionary. Invariably to make the oppressors do all of the suffering. That's right. Yeah. Uh, dictatorship, proletariat. Um, so, the, so Marx believed this was inevitable, that the proletariat would rise up, there'd be a revolution, and you'd be advancing the communist cause. Well, it didn't happen. And there was a group of German Marxists in, um, in Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt, Germany, who formed an institute called the Institute for Social Research in 1933, and then were welcomed to sort of matriculate uh, adjacent to Columbia University in 1935. It's called the Frankfurt Schools, as they became known, known as. Uh, and really, the Frankfurt School was made up of neo-Marxists and also neo-Freudians. And that brought this convergence of um, this, I think, what really laid the groundwork for the woke movement, which was identifying our oppressors at, in groups outside of ourselves, but also in the oppression of the moral law, that we repress ourselves. So we can get into that more in a bit. But um, so what they did is they realized, okay, we they, for, they were formed to analyze why did, did the, the um, proletariat not revolt? What happened? And how can we seed revolution in the West? And they, along with Antonio Gramsci, realized that the revolution had to be broadened beyond the division of class distinction into the culture. That we really, that really Western culture is uh, enormously buffers itself against revolution by having a whole host of um, ideas that are anathema to revolution. We have a respect for parents, respect for fatherhood, um, you know, a, a rule of law, order, you know, we have believe in order in society. And that was really in destabilizing the institutions that, that create stability for culture. You have to infiltrate those and destabilize them from the inside out. And through that effort over decades, it was a long game they knew, you would destabilize society enough um, through law, through media, through the family, through the sexual revolution, um, and ultimately through the academy and deeply through the academy. Yeah, this idea of the Frankfurt School, I suspect most people aren't aware of, or at least not nearly as many people as we would need to be. And when you n mention names like Adorno uh, or Habermas and, uh, and others, I mean, from the 30s through the 50s into the 60s, especially with the rise of a figure like Marcuse that you mentioned, uh, and again, it's not just neo-Marxian, it really is neo-Freudian. 
And so the conflict of the genders, the sexes, is now becoming the warp as well as the woof of the fabric of, of revolution. And it's really nothing less than a revolutionary ideology. Now, you mentioned early on some things that I really like. You know, for us as Christians, for us as Catholics, the idea of the word, the logos, is so important because that's how creation came into existence out of nothing, by the power of the word. And the word is not just um, the word is not just a power. We discover, of course, that it's a person when the word becomes flesh to dwell among us. But the logic of the logos is a love. And it is also justice. And so words have power. But what you show is how the devil uses words to weaponize them in order to subvert the truth and to wound us and to make us more aware of how wounded we are so that in the name of justice and compassion, uh, words instead of creating out of nothing, words instead of constructing things of beauty, words become weapons and they also become something that unleashes a, a destructive force. And so while we can talk about Hegel, we can talk about Marx, we can talk about Freud, we can talk about the Frankfurt School in Germany migrating to uh, Columbia in New York City. I'm glad you brought up Antonio Gramsci as well, because Gramsci is in Italy, uh, the single most influential revolutionary ideologue. It's hard to overestimate the influence that he had, not only there, but through his writings getting translated here and abroad as well. I think younger people are more familiar with Jacques Derrida, you know, or Michel Foucault, and those who are postmoderns and deconstructionists. But in a certain sense, they don't arrive on the scene out of nowhere or out of nothing. They really are feeding from the same poison trough, as it were. So the, I, I want to move on, but at the same time, I want to emphasize the extreme value of this opening section because you lay a foundation that in some ways is anti-foundational. You know, it, it is corrosive, it is destructive, it is consciously so, and it is powerfully effective for now going on two centuries. And so to remain ignorant of these figures, you know, we are so distracted by Brad Pitt or Will Smith or other people who are just like the big names. And they're the ones who influence pop culture. But pop culture is such a fad. It's for a day and it comes and goes. Whereas these people really do rule the world from the grave. 